I'd like to read with you a couple of verses, and I'd like to make the link with the hymn that we sang, um, that um, our hearts may be on fire. And this topic of prophecy is really to stir our hearts and to move our hearts to love the Lord and really look forward to his soon coming. Um, I referred yesterday to uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, where Paul speaks about uh, his love together with all those who love the appearance of the Lord. So those who look forward to the coming of our Lord because they love him. And although I mentioned yesterday that uh, prophecy is not um, a topic of the church. I mean, the church is one topic of study and prophecy is another topic. But there is this link. We love to study prophecy because we love the Lord. And so I would like to read a verse to begin with. And I have a couple of verses in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But I want to start with Revelation 1, verse 3. Revelation 1, verse 3. And while you're turning there, I just want to remind you of the fact that Revelation is like a framework. And that framework helps us to understand the flow of events, the prophetic events, uh, from chapter 4 to chapter 19. That's a framework. So that is an invitation for further study. And those who have signed up for that um, overview, you'll get also uh, an outline of Revelation where you see that structure. And in in connection with that framework, we can put all those prophecies of the Old Testament together and know uh, where they belong in which time frame and so on. But uh, I'd like to start with chapter 1, verse 3, Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things written in it for the time is near. We have seven times blessed in this book. This is the first time. So one who reads, and that's also public reading, is blessed. Those that hear the words of prophecy are blessed. So if you hear someone reading the book of Revelation, you are blessed by hearing this. But then it is also connected with keeping the things written in it. And that means um, to apply what we have learned. And we hope to see a few exhortations also for us as believers. When we study prophecy, there is always this prophetic edge. There is always a challenge connected with it. It is not just for pure information, as we said also in our prayer. It is really to stir up our hearts. And so I repeat, while prophecy in itself is not um, in connection with the church, it has to do with Israel, with this world, with God's ways, Yet, we as believers are interested in prophecy because it is connected with the Lord. Prophecy is connected with the introduction of the Lord. God is going to introduce his anointed one into this world. And that is why prophecy is important for us to study. And then Revelation uh, 19, verse 10. Revelation 19, verse 10. Just the second part of verse 10. For the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So here we see that prophecy really speaks about the Lord Jesus. Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And so this is its spirit. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So in other words, uh, when we study prophecy, we are studying also the interest of the Lord Jesus. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It's not um, to um, uh, lift up a veil for us or to satisfy our curiosity. Prophecy is really connected with the Lord's interest. And then uh, one more verse in Revelation, that is chapter 22, in our prayer we also thought of the soon coming of our Lord Jesus and this book of prophecy uh, is given to stir our hearts so that we are ready for his coming 
And that is really characteristic of John's ministry to uh, make us uh, overcomers and to have us um, be restored to first love. And in the spirit of first love, we expect the soon coming of the Lord. And we say in verse 20, or verse 20, uh, yeah, verse 20, come Lord Jesus. But I want to read from verse 18. Revelation 22, verse 18. I testify. Perhaps you remember yesterday I said the Lord Jesus is the great king in connection with righteousness. He is the great priest, as in the millennium will be seen on earth, but he is already now the priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But here we see him as the great prophet who testifies on behalf of God. He testifies to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. So again, you notice the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone take from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city which are written in this book. This is a very solemn warning. Many people have added or taken away from the book of prophecy. But instead of doing this, we are reminded to listen to his voice. And he says in verse 20, He that testifies these things says, Yea, I come quickly. So he wants to stir our hearts to be ready for his coming. And the response is, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So may as a result of the hymn that we sang, the prayer, the study that we have this afternoon, that our hearts may be stirred to be ready for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. This week I talked with a secretary, the specialist I had to visit for my eyes. And the secretary is a believer. And I talked to her. And we made a new appointment. And uh, I said, well, maybe the Lord will have come before that. He, she says, amen. So that is the right response, that we may be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all the saints. We all need his grace for every day, for every situation. Young people, uh, those who work, those who are retired, we all need the grace of the Lord Jesus. These resources are with us. And that is the background of which uh, what I want to say now in connection with prophecy. And I want first to turn with you to Luke 24. Luke 24, where we have the Lord's um, um, dialogue or interaction with the two disciples from Emmaus. That was the day of his resurrection. The day of the Lord's resurrection uh, is a very important day. You could study Luke 24. We see five different journeys. We see several openings. We see many testimonies, seven testimonies in connection with the resurrection. It's a wonderful chapter. But what I want to read now with you is the part of the interview, part of the discussion that the Lord had with these disciples in Luke 24. When he joined them, they were disappointed. They were downcast. They were discouraged. And the Lord asked them a few questions. And then he starts to speak to them. In verse uh, 25. So the Lord uh, first hears everything that's on their heart. And then he starts to speak to them. And we would say, well, that is very harsh. Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This is a very solemn word. These disciples, they loved God. They loved the scriptures. But they were blind. They had blinded themselves. And now the Lord calls them. He um, rebukes them. He says, fools. Because there was a lack of Response. There was a lack of faith. They had only selectively accepted some of God's thoughts. And that was the problem also with the Jewish leaders. Uh, we saw yesterday, and we could study that in much more detail, there were many prophecies that announced the first coming of the Lord Jesus. Those prophecies were so clear that all the rabbis, they taught when the Messiah will come, he will, heal, he will be able to heal a leper. Now, that's what the Lord did. 
they started to investigate, but they rejected him. They would know that he would uh, heal the blind. If you read Isaiah, uh, for example, chapter 35, you see that he would open the eyes of the blind. And when the Lord did it, for example, in John 9, the Lord opened many blind's eyes, but in John 9, it's very clearly that the man there who was healed said, is that not amazing? That never happened. So he must be the Messiah. What did they do? They threw him out of the synagogue. They did not want to accept this testimony. And these two disciples here, they were also affected by that kind of unbelief. They were not uh, as rebellious as the leaders, but they were also affected by this unbelief. And this can happen to us too, uh, beloved. We can harden ourselves. I want to come back to that later. So the Lord wants really to help us that we will not harden ourselves, that we will not be fooled, but that we will understand his thoughts. And it's sad to say, uh, to, to see this when you see how the leadership rejected the Lord Jesus despite all the clear evidence that he had given that he was the Messiah. That would be a study in itself. But now I want to move on in Luke 24. And that's my point now in verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? See, when the Lord was talking with these disciples, he showed them that this was God's program. And he summarizes it here. Ought not. That this must not. This had to happen this way. And even the angels had said that in um, Luke 24 verse 7, um, where they quote what the Lord had spoken beforehand. If you see the context there in Luke 24 6, where the angels say, or the, the two men there, but were angels, to the women there at the tomb, they say, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, verse 7, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. That was God's program. It had to happen this way. And so what the Lord says now himself here, so now he says the same thing that he had said before his sufferings. Now he says this after his sufferings and resurrection. Ought not Christ, verse 26, to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. The sufferings and the glories go together. First Peter 1 shows that very clearly. The prophets of the Old Testament, they spoke about these sufferings that were coming and also of the glories that should follow. And so the Lord is now quoting scripture to these disciples. From verse 27 we see that. Beginning at Moses. So what, does, what is the remedy? If we have failed to understand God's thoughts, if we have failed to believe God's thoughts, what is the remedy? Go back to the scriptures. Of course in the right condition of heart. But go back to the scriptures. And that's what the Lord did. He started with Moses. And then through all the prophets... He expounded to them in all scriptures. Perhaps you know that the Jews divided the Old Testament in three portions. Moses, the Torah, uh, and then the prophets started with the early prophet, Joshua, to the latter prophets. And then the writings, the Chetubim, the writings included also Daniel. Yesterday we had Daniel 9, this overview about the events in connection with the coming of the Messiah. And so he quoted also from the scriptures, perhaps even from Daniel 9 also, to them, to show to them the things concerning himself. Do you see? The key is the Lord Jesus himself. He is the key. Moses writing. Moses said that God would raise up a man, a prophet, like Moses. And he said, hear him. They did not hear him. And they put themselves, therefore, under judgment. And so this applies to all the scriptures. The scriptures focus on the Lord Jesus. And this is how we should study the scriptures. To see how from Genesis 1 to Revelation, Revelation 22, the Lord Jesus is the very center. He's the object of uh, prophecy and the subject and the contents, everything. So he shows them the things concerning himself. And what do they say then afterwards in verse 32? And they said one to another, it was after the Lord had vanished out of their sight, they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened 
to us the scriptures. See what we had in our hymn, Kindle within us a holy desire, like that which was found in thy people of old, who tasted thy love, and whose hearts were on fire. These disciples, their hearts had not been on fire. They had been discouraged. But the Lord, by, by, while speaking to them about himself, their hearts became on fire again. And they say, while he opened to us the scriptures. You see, that is the key. The scriptures present this person of the Lord, and the scriptures were opened to them. The Lord himself opened the scriptures. He is the living word. He is also the interpret, the great interpreter who interprets the scriptures. And the, the same he did later in this chapter when the, the two disciples went back then to the disciples in Jerusalem. And then the Lord appeared to them. And what do we read in Luke 24, 44? He said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. So three times before the Lord uh, had his sufferings, the angels quoted this, that he had said these things must happen. Then the Lord himself repeated that to the disciples as we just saw. And now he speaks to all of them, referring to what he had said before. All things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. The Psalms, again, is part of the writings, the third part. Concerning me. See again what uh, is emphasized. All these scriptures concern him. Wonderful. That is how we read the scriptures. That is how our hearts can be um, warmed up again and burn for the Lord Jesus. We are living in a world that rejected the Lord. And our hearts are also, we are failing people. And so we need to be stirred in our hearts that the Lord Jesus becomes fresh in his greatness for us, before us again. And notice what the Lord does then in verse 45. He opened their understanding. So he opened the scriptures. He interpreted to them the scriptures concerning the things, uh, concerning himself. And then also he opened their understanding. That is what we need through work of the Holy Spirit. He wants to open our understanding so that we may grasp these things. You cannot grasp these things by just doing an intellectual effort that is also needed. But a work of the Spirit of God is needed at the same time. Now I want to turn with you to Acts 17. When the Lord Jesus went to heaven, Acts 1, we see that he sent the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. And the Lord started a new work. And he addressed the same people that rejected him on the, while he was on earth. He addressed them again now through the apostles. That's what we see in Acts. And they, some accepted that testimony. Many rejected it. But what we see in Acts, then there is great increase despite the tribulation, despite the uh, persecution. And one of the uh, signs of this work of the Lord is the salvation of Saul of Tarsus. The great persecutor, he became the great servant. And now we see this Saul of Tarsus, now as the Apostle Paul, in Acts 17. And what he is doing in Acts 17, and you'll see the link now with the, the study of prophecy, he is taking the scriptures, just like the Lord did in, Acts, in uh, uh, Luke 24, and he is applying them. Now let's just read um, Acts 17 from verse where Paul was now on the second journey in Thessalonica. Verse 2, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures. I'll just turn in my other Bible also that I can follow it there as well. In Acts 17, I just want to highlight a few expressions there to see with you how important the Scriptures are in connection with the study of prophecy. And that is now in connection with the first coming of the Lord. Here, these prophecies uh, relate to the first coming of the Lord. And then, when we grasp that, we can also see how prophecy addresses the second coming of the Lord. So, when we can rely on the scriptures in connection with the first coming, we can also rely on the scriptures in connection with the second coming of the Lord. Now, Acts 17, where Paul then shows the Jews 
uh, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. That's a term that's only used in connection with Paul's ministry. Ten times in the book of Acts, we find that he did this. He lectured or he interacted with them, or as this translation has reasoned with them, from the scriptures. Number one. Number two, in verse three, opening. What does that mean? He opened the scriptures. The same that the Lord did in Luke 24. And the same word is used. This word is uh, thorough opening. The word is only used eight times in the New Testament. And that verb indicates a thorough opening. The Lord opened the scriptures in Luke 24. The Lord opened their understanding. And now what Paul does here, he opened the scriptures. Just like the Lord did. And the Holy Spirit did the rest. We'll see that in a moment. The Holy Spirit opened their hearts. Then the third point that we see here, laying down. So that was like putting a deposit before them. This word is also sometimes translated something entrusted at the deposit. He put something down. He laid down. What did he lay down? That the Christ must have suffered and risen up from among the dead, and that this is the Christ. So this deposit has uh, three elements. This must, so the deposit implies what we saw earlier, it had to be, this was God's program, the Christ must suffer. Uh, Suppose that the Jews would have accepted the Lord. That could not have happened, because the scriptures predicted that he would be rejected. So that is the reason why he was not accepted. So even if those uh, signs were so evident, the scriptures foresaw that the Messiah would be rejected. He had to be rejected. That's what the scriptures told. And this must happen. And in that connection, he must suffer. But also, he must rise up from among the dead. This is God's program. Because by the resurrection, he laid a new foundation. And on that foundation, God could build the church. That is a new work. And even the salvation of the Jews in the future will be on the basis of the resurrection. Even the world to come, the millennium, that will be introduced is on the basis of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Without that, no promises can be fulfilled. No plans of God can be fulfilled. And the second part, or the third part of the program is that this is the Christ. So you see, he must suffer, he must rise from among the dead, but then he is the Christ. Jesus, whom I announce you. So he is the Christ. So he showed very clearly, this is the Messiah. Based on these scriptures, he showed, this is the Messiah. They had rejected him. They had not believed that he is the Messiah. Uh, we have John's gospel in verse uh, chapter 20 verse 31 says these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ he is the anointed and that he is the son of God that is in two words put together the Christ the son of God that is the es- the essence of this message that uh, uh, Moses uh, excuse me that um, Paul brought, and that is in line with Moses, it's in line with the prophets, in line with the scriptures. This is what was God's program was, and now it was fulfilled. So the conclusion was, if they would study these scriptures, Paul would say, look, this rejected Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Christ, he is the Messiah. In him all these things have been fulfilled. And then there is a fourth element at the end of verse 3, Jesus whom I announce to you. Here we see Paul as the great messenger. The word is also used in connection with John the Baptist. is the proclaimer. He proclaimed something. He's a herald. Paul became a herald to proclaim, to bring a message. I want to make a little application here for all of us. We are messengers. The Lord has left us here in this world to be his messengers. To present A new doctrine? A new philosophy? No. To present Jesus. A person. That is where we are left. For for this purpose we are left in this world. To be his messengers. And now notice the response in verse 5. Some of them believed. Um, Really it means that they were uh, persuaded. In verse. 
Yeah, this belief implies that they were convicted, that they were persuaded by this message, and so they responded through faith. That implies that uh, intellect was convicted, the emotions, the heart, everything was now made subject to this message, to this truth. And that is also a challenge for us. God wants us to be convicted of these things. And then, as a result, they joined to Paul and Silas, which meant also that they were baptized. I don't know whether there are some young people here who have not been baptized, who believe but have not been baptized. This joining themselves to Paul and Silas implied that they were baptized, and they separated themselves from the Jews and also from their uh, pagan background. Depends on what person you talk about. And so that is the deposit that Paul made in connection with prophecy. And that is what I just wanted to uh, highlight. And so there is a very uh, relevant message for us also today. These things are still true for us today. Now I want to try to make the connection with the prophecies about the second coming of the Lord. And see how there also um, the moral condition is very important. What we have seen now in Luke 24, the right moral condition is needed to accept the teaching of the Lord, to accept prophetic ministry. We have seen in uh, Revelation 22 the importance of the right spiritual condition, also in chapter 1, verse 3. We have seen in Revelation 19 how the Lord Jesus, the spirit, the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, or the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It's both ways. And so that is connected with the right spiritual condition. And that is also true in connection with his second coming. I hope you'll follow the connection. The right spiritual condition is needed to accept him in connection with his first coming. And so it will be needed for the Jews and for this whole world to have the right spiritual condition to accept his second coming. And that is what I want to say now in uh, in closing. A few thoughts. Uh, If you can turn with me to uh, Matthew 23. Matthew 23 is a very sobering chapter where the Lord Jesus, the great king, as we see him in Matthew, speaks also as the judge. The king is the judge and the judge is the king, the rejected king. And so he shows in that chapter very clearly the failure of the people. They had failed to recognize him They had failed because their heart was not in the right condition. And as a result of that, they had become guilty of his uh, death. Now we read Matthew 23 from verse 34. Let's start at verse 34. Therefore, behold, I send to you prophets... And, I, and wise men and scribes. The Lord said this after seven accusations. He had given seven accusations. You can read that uh, at home uh, where the Lord exposed these uh, wrong leaders in their wrong uh, condition. And now he says, Therefore I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. That is a reference to the book of Acts. This is what the Lord would do. The Lord from heaven would send to them prophets, wise men, and scribes. That is what we see in the book of Acts. And what would happen? Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and will persecute from city to city. That's what we see in the book of Acts. Verse 35, So that all righteous blood shed upon the earth should come upon you from the blood of Righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. So the Lord shows how they are the descendants of a guilty race. And their guilt had reached the climax by the rejection of the Messiah. Verse 36. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. I pause here and then we continue verse 37 a little bit later. 
Why would all these things come upon this generation? Why would God's judgment come upon them? If you study the Gospels, you will see how the Lord Jesus presented himself to them as the Messiah. I hinted on that earlier already. And he had given these signs that he was the Messiah, unmistakably. And there was one sign in particular at at the end of his public ministry before he left the house of Israel, In Matthew uh, 13, in Matthew 12, we see there was one special healing. There was a man who was blind, he was demon-possessed, and he was could not speak. He was dumb. And so he had three major problems. The Lord healed that man, cast out the demons, or the demon. And so the multitude said, now this must be the Messiah. And then the leader said, no, he did that through Beelzebub. And then the Lord shows how inconsistent their reasoning was. Many arguments the Lord shows. This is totally inconsistent. But my point is, because they rejected the Messiah, despite the clear evidence, they put themselves under God's judgment. The Lord says in Matthew 12, this is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. They had seen the evidence through these signs. This is the Messiah. They knew this is the Messiah. There was no question about it. But they didn't want to accept him. So they uh, said he did it through Beelzebub, through the devil, really. And so they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was working through the Lord Jesus. And the Lord said, this sin cannot be forgiven. And because of that sin, the whole nation came under judgment. And that judgment was then fulfilled in the year 70, partially, and later in 135. So this judgment will then ultimately be fulfilled, what we saw in uh, Daniel 9, 27 yesterday, there will be destruction poured out over the desolate. The Jerusalem will be destroyed another time. But that is as a result of the rejection of the Messiah and as a result of the acceptance of a false Messiah, whether in history, like Bar Kokhba, Or in the future, near future, they will accept a false Messiah. And that is why they will place themselves under God's judgment. God will have to deal with that. Now, what does the Lord say in verse 37? We go back to Matthew 23, 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent unto her. How often would I have gathered thy children as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? And... Ye would not. That's a key. In Matthew 12 we see that. They would not. This is the key to understand that. I want to read another verse later in Acts 7 about this. They would not. That is the condition of hardening under which they had placed themselves. That is why God allowed this judgment, uh, 70 AD, to come over them. That is why God will allow in the future these judgments to come over them. And that's summarized here in verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. The Lord left the house, Matthew 13, verse 1. Uh, The temple was God's dwelling place. But here we see there is Ichabod. Ichabod, you remember, when the ark left uh, Israel in the days of uh, Samuel, then uh, Phineas' daughter said Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. And this is what happened in the temple later, the first temple. We see in Ezekiel that the glory departed. The glory went up. And so here we see again, the Lord Jesus had been among them, but he left them. He left the house and he says, your house is left unto you desolate. That's a terrible judgment. Ichabod, the glory is gone. This is still true today. Even when they will then had the second temple, the glory was not there. The Lord was there, but they rejected him. And the third temple, there will be the Antichrist. But still, it will be the temple of God, because first, the service, according to Mosaic in ordinances, will be reinstituted, and they will serve God. So that's after the rapture, all these things. And then they will accept, the, the, the multitude will accept the Antichrist, and so on. That's a little bit what we saw yesterday in Daniel 9. Now, what is the connection that I want to highlight now? The house will be let desolate, but there is a hope. 
Verse 39. For I say unto you, ye shall in no wise see me henceforth until ye say, Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. This is a quote from Psalm 118. It will be an interesting psalm to study, but we cannot do it now. But there is this word uh, from, quoted from, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. A couple of years ago, we had a visit of the Pope, and all around was written, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's blasphemy. It only applies to the Lord. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. It only applies to the Lord Jesus. Now, the point here is, when the people will call out for his coming, then he will come. But when is that going to happen? When they will change their attitude. When they will repent. And that is why you need to read Isaiah 53. We cannot do that either. But you read Isaiah 53, there you see the confession of the Jews of Israel at the end of the Great Tribulation. So we will see a remnant that will believe after the rapture, soon after the rapture. They will go through the nations, preach the gospel of the kingdom. And then they still will reject, the multitude will still reject the God and the Messiah. And they will accept a false Messiah who will persecute the true believers, who will persecute every believer. Many details in Revelation 13. But the point is now that at the end of the Great Tribulation, we have seen how the king of the north will attack, the king of the south will attack. They will be in great distress. The country will be inundated by uh, forces from the enemy. Then they will cry to the Lord, not in despair like in the year 70, but then they will cry to the Lord, really turn to the Lord as we see here. Then they will exp- be ready for his coming. And then he will come. Then they, after their repentance, Isaiah 53, then he will come. You can read Isaiah 54 in connection with that. And then blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. Then they will be ready. Now, two more verses uh, in connection with this uh, point. One in Acts 7 and one in Isaiah 28. In Acts 7... We see again this hardening, this hardening that characterized them during all generations, uh, also characterized them in the days of the early church, because the leadership rejected that testimony. As they had rejected the testimony of the Lord here on earth, they rejected the new testimony that came to them from heaven through the apostles. And in Acts 7, the messenger was even put to death, uh, uh, Stephen. But before he was put to death, We see in Acts 7, verse 51, that he comes with the verdict. He is the true prophet who testifies. And his verdict is very solemn. They put him on trial, but here he puts them on trial. Verse 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Remember what the Lord said in Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent unto her. How often would I have gathered thy children? And I forgot to mention at that moment there we see the Lord as a mother hen trying to gather them as a hen, mother hen gathers her chickens under her wings. They did not want. You would not. That's the same condition here. They had hardened themselves. They had persecuted the prophets. And now even... Uh, see in Acts 7 verse 52 and have slain them who showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have now been become betrayers and murderers that is the height of wickedness they would not who have received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it they would not now we turn to Isaiah 28 Keep in mind, they would not. So what does that mean? A work of God will have to take place. And that's described in Isaiah 28. When the Lord had said, I will not come back before you will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That means repentance is needed, obviously. But also, and that is what I highlight now, a work of God is needed. The two go together. When 
you got saved. I don't know how many years, for some it's many years ago, for some it's a very short time ago. When you got saved, you repented, you wept, you were sorry for your sins. At the same time, there was a work of God. It's a mystery. Now, beloved, that applies also to the second coming of the Lord. Isaiah 28 where he scolds them in verse 1, woe to the crown of pride of the drunkards. The the, the woe, similar to Stephen's woe. And then a little bit later, you can read that section for yourself. Then in verse 14, therefore hear the word of Jehovah, ye scornful men. So he scolds them. They had not believed. And in their unbelief, what did they do in verse 15? Ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol have we made an agreement. Does you remember the reference, Daniel 9, they would make the covenant for seven years? This is the reference. Covenant with death and with Sheol. And that was for their protection. They had made that agreement. But what would happen? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Because of their unbelief, because of their hardening, because of their idolatry, God will send the king of the north. There will be this inundation, this overflowing scourge. But they think it will not come. But it will come because of their hardness and their their, uh, idolatry. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. This is going on today. Of course, this is not what we see today is not yet the fulfillment of prophecy, but there's the preparation. As I said yesterday, the pieces are put on the, on, on the board, on the chessboard, but the fulfillment of these prophecies is still future. So when they say this, when they rely on themselves, their own wiles and efforts, it will not succeed. And that is why verse 16 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I lay for foundation in Zion a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. That's what God has done in connection with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, his death, resurrection. He has laid that foundation. And he that trusts shall not make haste. That was what the believers did in Acts. They put their trust in him. That is what you and I have done. We have put our trust in him. And that is what they will have to do in the future. They will have to put their trust in him. Not in lies, as in verse 15, but they put their trust in him. Now, what is needed for that? For that is needed a work of God. You see this covenant that they have made with death in verse 18. God says it shall be annulled. Your agreement with Sheol shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. So despite this covenant, it will happen. And he shall be trodden down by it. Then they will call upon. That is the height of the great tribulation. When they will be trodden down. Then they will call out to God. You see. But that is God's strange work. If you go to verse 21. For Jehovah will rise up as, a, as on Mount Perazim. He will be moved with anger as in the valley of Gibeon. That he may do his work. His strange work. And perform his act, his unwanted act. What is that? That is God's judgment. He will even judge Israel. Not only the nations, also Israel. He will do that. But because of that act of God, and that is my point now, the rest of the chapter we will see, there will be something that is going to happen. Verse 22. Now therefore be ye not scorners, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord Jehovah of hosts a consumption and one determined upon the whole land. This is God's plan. That cannot be changed. Judgment need to be poured out over their wickedness. And that can only be poured out after the rapture. See, for us, for the believers belonging to the church, the Lord Jesus has carried the full load of sins on the cross. But in connection with Israel the believers will have to suffer because Israel has hardened themselves and God will pour out in his strange work, in this act, in his unwanted act, judgment over them. And the believers among them will suffer because they, were part, they, will, they will be part of Israel. That is why they will suffer under this tremendous judgment, as we find in the Psalms. But my point now is, through this all, God is going to 
produce something, there will be this tremendous change at the end of the Great Tribulation when they said they will call upon him and then he will come. That is what is described now in the rest of the chapter in this parable, and we will close with this, because that is an illustration of that work of God that's going to take place. And so, when there was a work of God needed so that we would believe in connection with the first coming of the Lord Jesus. And so there is a work of God that's going to take place that they will believe in connection with the second coming of the Lord Jesus. There are great differences, of course. I, will, I only speak now about this parallel, a work of God. And so while God is acting in judgment, there will be something happening. Let's just read verse 23 to verse 29, and I will give a few comments. Give ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Does the plowman plow all day to sow? Is he all day opening and breaking the clods of his land? Does he not, when he has leveled the face thereof, cast abroad, dill, and scatter, come in, and set the wheat in rows, and the barley in an appointed place, and the rye in its border? His God does instruct him in his judgment. He does teach him. For the dill is not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned upon about upon the coming, but dill is beaten out with a staff and come in with a rod. Bread corn is crushed because he will not ever be threshing it, and if he drove the wheels of his cart and his horses over it, he would not crush it. This also comes forth from Jehovah of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel, great in wisdom. Beloved, my suggestion is, this explains this change. The Lord said, you will, I will not come back until you call out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When will they call out? After these judgments have been poured over them. And at the end of the great tribulation, they will turn to God as a nation. Then two-thirds of them, as we know from Zechariah, will have been executed. And only one-third, and even of them, there will some uh, die. But then the nation as such will turn to God, and then they will call upon him, and then he will come. That is when his feet will stand on the Mount of Olive. But this work is needed, as we have in this parable. That is my voice, that is the Lord's authority, but it's also his wisdom is at work. He is at work, like the plowman, like the sower, like the farmer. All these are instructions how God is acting in his great wisdom. And he instructs the, the Lord as the great judge, uh, God instructs him. The Lord Jesus is the God-man. So God instructs him in connection with judgment. He teaches him. The Lord Jesus was taught by God. As a man, he was taught by God. Isaiah 50 and other uh, scriptures uh, bear that out. And so in his wisdom, we see how he acts in a different way. He uh, deals, like the farmer, different, connected with uh, the wheat or the barley or the cumin. All these, these five different uh, f seeds are treated in a different way and that is how God s is selective in his judgment he knows exactly how to apply the right measure of judgment so that there will be a result just a little parenthesis here an application he knows what we can bear and he allows certain things to happen in our lives but it is for our good it is to produce something and so here we see the wisdom with which he acts and that wisdom he will use in his judgment in the future day in connection with Israel to make them ready for the coming of the Messiah. And so the conclusion is he who acts in wisdom in this judgment, the result is this also comes forth from Jehovah of hosts. He is at work. He will hide himself for a while, but he will produce something because he's wonderful in counsel. The word wonderful is also the name of the Lord Jesus. Wonderful, Isaiah uh, 9. And that's really only a term used for God. Psalm 118 also. And so he's wonderful in counsel. This is God. His purpose will stand. He's wonderful in counsel. And the way he applies his thoughts, he's great in wisdom. There we see his ways. His ways show his wisdom. So, 
amazing how God can produce this change in those hardened people, as we have read here in chapter 28. As we've seen in Acts 7, they hardened themselves. Yet God produced something in them. He got Saul of Tarsus. He got you and me. Were we, had we not hardened themselves, ourselves against God? I remember as a little kid, my parents talked about the Lord, but it took quite some time before I responded to that call. There is hardening, and that hardening in God's wisdom, he will deal with that. But that doesn't excuse that hardening, of course. That doesn't excuse any rebellion. This is a mystery, beloved, how God's ways and our doing go together, and something will be produced for the glory of God. Uh, you read Romans 9 to 11, and when you see at the end of Romans 11, as a result of God's ways, who will accomplish his plans, everything will be fulfilled. Glory will be brought to God. From him is everything, through him is everything, and unto is him is everything. Everything to his glory. So it goes through very deep waters, through very deep uh, valleys, but glory will be brought to him. And today, beloved... The Lord wants our hearts to be stirred as we have in the hymn. And as we saw in the example of the uh, disciples of Emmaus, that our hearts will be in tune with the Lord Jesus so that he can use us as his instruments till he comes. Maybe today. And so he wants us to be ready for his soon coming. You read 1 Thessalonians 4. That's hope that he will come soon. In the meantime, we may serve him. We may serve him as devoted disciples. And there will be a work of God then also in us and for us, for us, in us, and with us. He wants to transform us. As we see with the disciples in the book of Acts, he wants to transform us today. So he will transform his own people so that they will accept the Lord in his second coming. And then the Lord will introduce the millennial reign. This topic of prophecy is really wonderful because we learn more about the Lord Jesus. We see more how great he is. But at the same time, he teaches us very practical and stirs up our hearts also for him. So maybe, maybe give him the glory and the praise in our daily lives till he comes. Amen.